So this morning we are honoured to have a guest here, Ash Gulo. Uh, if you were been to one of the seminars we put on, whether yesterday or in previous years, you've definitely reaped the benefit of the wisdom there for stewardship and generosity and, and what God can do in and through us as well in this area. And so I'd love to just invite him to the stage this morning, Ash, as you Thanks. come and share with us all your wisdom. Thanks, pal. That's Stuck good with you, mate. Good morning. All right, it's great to be back with you, Highlands Church. It's been two years. I think uh, last year, well, I'm not going to talk about what happened last year, but uh, it's just good to be back with you all. I think this is our fourth or fifth year of coming and, and being here with you guys. And every time Karen and I come to be with pastors uh, Doug and Beck and Ken and Moira, we just love seeing this place expand. And then hearing about the expansion coming up, and you guys don't muck around, do you, up here in the Highlands? We love it. It's absolutely fantastic. And I'm honored to be, to be part of uh, Expansion Month. Um, what an exciting, exciting month uh, to do this. But yes, Thank you, Doug and Beck, for having us, Ken and Moira. We love you guys, and uh, it's always an honor to share the platform. Uh, today, I'd like to ask you a question. What is the number one thing that most people exchange their life for? It's money. Good answer. Thank you. Exactly. People, most people exchange their, their life. So today, we're going to talk about money. It's a topic in life that is infrequently discussed, yet it affects us every, every single day, and, and often multiple times a day. You see, the world... The world revolves around money. They say it's the language of the earth. Wherever you go on this planet, money can just about sort out any problem you find yourself in. In fact, the Bible in Ecclesiastes 10.19 says that money answers everything. I think we've got some slides there. Uh, money answers everything. The Bible in its ancient wisdom thousands of years ago knew that it, it had an important part to play in people's lives then, just as it does today. But as important as it is, there are no subjects in school on how to effectively manage money. Most families don't speak to their kids about it. It's just not done. Uh, I was asking my dad about this very thing. And he said he was never taught by his dad about how to budget, uh, the perils of debt, how to effectively handle money. And so he didn't pass it on to us as well. Uh, it's even considered rude by many people to discuss it. Just don't talk about money, uh, particularly in public. You know, I completed an entire business degree at university and not once was taught how to budget or manage my money. Why is it that we feel uh, uncomfortable when we talk about money? Is it that we feel embarrassed about maybe our financial situation, uh, about perhaps some of the mistakes that we, we might have made, or we feel a little bit self-conscious about how much or how little that we might have? Do we maybe feel guilty about how much we've, we've wasted or feel a little bit insecure about how, perhaps how little we know about the topic and how to manage it? Well, if you've ever felt like this, you're in good company. You're sitting in the right place because it's a very common thing for us all to feel like that. Now, while society is silent often on the topic of money, the good thing is the Bible isn't. It talks extensively about money. Now, for those of you who might be new to church and exploring this whole faith thing, I'm going to refer to some uh, wise quotes, some proverbs, and, uh, and some, some texts from the good book, from the Bible. So if you're someone who hasn't ever opened a Bible before, don't sweat it. If you don't understand the context, that's cool. Just enjoy the stories, okay? But as I was saying, the Bible talks extensively about money. It contains about 500 verses on faith, on prayer, but over 2,000 verses deal with the topic about and surrounding money. Uh, around about 40% of Jesus' stories, his parables, relate to issues of finance. It's very clear that God has plenty to say about wealth and giving. In fact, it's the second most talked about topic in the Bible after God himself. So why does Jesus talk about it so much? Well, I believe it's because money affects us daily. It has a dramatic effect. on It's a pivotal and it's a central part of our lives and our relationships and affects our capacity to do things. So whether you're a believer uh, in Jesus here today or not, financial pressure will be one of the biggest things that you face in your life. In fact, it's the number one cause of marital stress and breakdown in this nation today. You will feel like a slave, friends, if you're forever playing catch-up, financial catch-up all your life, going further and further behind each month. And I believe this is why Jesus talked about it so much in the Bible, and it's good for us to talk about it as well. You see, he understood that money has the power to affect our lives for good or for bad. He understood that you and I are either going to win over money, or money will win over us and will end up being its servant. In fact, uh, in Matthew 6.24, it says this, no one can serve two masters either. He'll hate one and love the other 
or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. You see, I believe Jesus understood that there's a fundamental connection between our spiritual lives and how we think about and relate to money. You'll either be in love with money. You've heard the old saying, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. You'll either be in love with money or you'll be in love with Jesus. The unfettered love for and pursuit of money, I believe, will take us in the opposite direction of Christ. And that is why Jesus wanted to talk about it a lot. Money is a great tool, guys, but it's a, it's a real lousy master. So how does it become your master? Well, uh, if, if you find yourself in a spending hole, or you become a, a slave to earning because you've bought things that are too big, or perhaps way outside of, uh, of your ability to pay, you'll become a slave to earning. You have to go to work and earn for these things. Or maybe you're going to overwork to become rich enough to buy something, a certain thing, but either way, you'll be spending your life in pursuit of money. And when money puts up its prices, okay, with inflation or the buying power of money becomes lower, you're going to be working even harder to try and keep up. And voila, money has you on its mouse wheel. That's how you can become a slave to money. But the Jesus way is a little bit different. Let me ask you a couple of questions this morning. How did, how did Jesus relate to money? Well, we know that he controlled it. He he used it. He didn't lack, and there was no evidence that he was in any form of debt. Jesus clearly served only, only one master. That was God. He didn't serve money. If Jesus was here today, and you asked him how much, or whether he wants you to be rich or poor, I should say, well, I think he'd say he doesn't mind how much you or I have. What he does care about is our heart and our soul and who we choose to serve. You see, more than anything, I believe that Jesus wants you and I to walk with him in eternity. In this life, Walk with him and in the next life as well. We believe as Christians that there's a heaven. And if you choose to have him as part of your life, well, you can be with him in eternity. It's open for anyone who who invites Jesus in as part of their life. Here's another question. Uh, If you ask Jesus whether money is good or bad, what do you think he might say? Well, I think, yeah, neither. I think he'd say that money is, is amoral. It takes on the character of its possessor. In fact, it could the same bit of money could be used to feed a hungry person in the morning in our town. And later that night could be used to to do something that would destroy someone in a drug deal or some form of a commission of a crime. Money is a a tool to be used that takes on the possession of its holder. It's it's neither good or bad. And it can be used for good or bad. In fact, I believe there are four things that Jesus might tell us if he were here today. When it comes to money. How do I know this? Well, they're there. They're plain to see in the Bible. And I want to share with you how some of these keys, these biblical keys have worked in, in Karen and my life uh, and let you in on a bit of my story uh, and some of the decisions that we made around money that led to disaster and then led to a comeback and how you can put these principles in practice in your life, these ancient principles and, and win with money. Shape your financial future and put money in its proper place within your world. Sound all right? Excellent. Well, I believe the first thing that Jesus would tell us today, if he were here, is he would say, don't sweat it. All right? Don't let material needs overwhelm you. I have got you looked after. And the truth is, getting by in life can be real tough sometimes. I know what it's like to have more month than money. It stresses you out. It can make you anxious. It feels like uh, uh, well, you can just get anxious. Uh, it feels overwhelming. You can just get anxious worrying about how the future's going to unfold. It can be suffocating. And I know everyone here will be at a different point on their financial and faith journey, but here's the good news. There's a God out there that actually cares for you and cares for me and cares for our financial situation and how you do it. In fact, he tells us don't do it alone. We're not on this journey alone when we have Christ in our life. He wants us to invite in his help and be part of the solutions that you and I need. In Matthew 6, 33, I think it's on the screen, it's uh, 6, 31 rather, to 33, it says this. It says, don't worry about these things, your, your daily needs. What will we eat? What will we drink? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows your needs. Seek first the kingdom of God above all else. Live righteously, and He, God, will give you everything that you need. He wants to supply your and my need, so we don't need to sweat it. In fact, if you have a problem... Bring it to him in prayer. It goes on uh, in Philippians 4, 6 to say, be anxious for only some things. Be anxious occasionally. No, no. It says be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. There's a real key in here for our financial lives. We're all going to feel financial stress and pressure at some time. 
Well, instead of us freaking out about it, let's just take it to God in prayer. God, I'm really struggling. I'm stressed about it. Bring it to him in prayer because he wants to get involved and help. Basically, what you cannot control, take to him in prayer. Remember, you're part of a generous community here. You're part of a community at Highlands Church that cares about one another. If you need help, reach out. You know, we've got an info point out the back. And, and if you're here today and, and struggling, going through whatever difficulty you've got, let us know. Because there is a community here that, that wants to help. You'll find if you ask help, isn't far away. I know this church is committed to loving and, and practically supporting the community here. And each of us are part of, each, of God's plan for one another. We're called to help one another out. Jesus would encourage us not to sweat it. But I also think he would also encourage us to begin to control what we can. And that's my second point. Control what you can. In Proverbs 21.5, it says, Good planning and, say and, and. Good planning and hard work lead to prosperity. Now, this is what I love about this scripture. Both of those things, I control. I, I control how hard I plan or whether I don't plan. I control how hard I work. Both of those things are within your and my control. I'll give you a bit of my story. At 17 years old, uh, I flunked out of school. Uh, it wasn't a great moment in my life. I'd worked so hard to try and get the marks that I needed to get into law school. And I remember going down to the post office that day and opening the envelope and pulling out the results and my heart just sank. Uh, I didn't get anywhere close to the results that I needed to get into law school, let alone university. It just didn't go my way and I'd worked so hard. And I felt like a complete failure. The circumstances um, began to blur my, my goals and my dreams. You know, school tells you that, you know, this is so important. I, I did schooling in, in New South Wales, and they said, this HSC result you get will determine your future. You know, that's what you get taught as students. And it just felt like my future had just been kicked in the guts. And I felt so overwhelmed and, and just thinking, well, you know, we spoke about hope this morning. You can feel like your hope starts to get a little bit robbed. But what I did is I took control of my thoughts and I began to lean into God as I knew he cared for me and he had a plan for me. Why? Because it says so in the word. And, and I knew that his plan for me was greater than my circumstances. I held onto that scripture in Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean on, on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll direct your paths. My circumstance was screaming failure. They were, they were screaming like, I'm not, I'm not going to get to where I want to go. But it says trust in the Lord. So I said about controlling some things. I said to God, look, uh, I took it to him in prayer. I said, I'm not going to be anxious for the future. God, I'll do me. I will control what I can. I'll work hard, but you need to do your part. You know, Stephen Covey, the author, says that we're not a product of our circumstances. We're a product of our decisions or our actions. You see, circumstances are going to happen to you and I all the time, which we can't control. What we can control and we need to control is our actions and our decisions on what we decide to do. So I was able to control how hard I worked. I was able to control my attitude, and I refused to give up. I, I controlled what I could, and I prayed for help. Like Philippians, that verse we just read, bring it to him in prayer. I wasn't going to sweat it. I knew that God had a plan for me, just like he's got a plan for you, and he'll direct our steps. And I knew that wasn't, that failure, that moment of failure wasn't the end of my story. You see, I believe that in the midst of every challenge, there's always an opportunity. You know, just because a storm is present in our life, it doesn't mean that God's absent. I'll read that again. Just because a storm is present doesn't mean God is absent. If you're going through a storm, he's going to be right there in the midst of it with you. You know, and he's given you and I talents, abilities, skills, resources. He wants us to use those. He expects us to use those, to control those things, to get through life's storms. I love the story uh, in the Bible when uh, the disciples in Jesus were out on a boat, they were crossing, I think it was the Sea of Galilee. And, and it says that a mighty storm uh, blew up, such that the, the fishermen, the disciples, uh, many of them were seasoned fishermen. These guys knew how to control a boat, would have been out in many, many storms. They were doing all that they could. They were probably you know, rowing, bringing in the sails. I mean, I'm not a boatie, so I don't know the proper terminology. But they were working hard to try and keep the boat upright. And it got to the point that they actually thought they were going to die. This is how serious the storm was. And then what does the story say they did? They went to the front because Jesus was sound asleep in the front of the boat, having a good old time, letting his guys work. And they woke him up. They brought Jesus in on the situation. But here's the amazing thing. Yes, it's bringing Jesus in, but they did all they could as well. And then Jesus got up and commanded the storm. You see, it's a co-partnership between us and Jesus. Bring Jesus in on your situation, but control what you can. Pressure and challenges, guys, are going to come to us in life. We just don't give up. 
You know, 23, the story thankfully didn't end. That fateful day when I opened my school um, marks. At 23 years old, I ended up graduating top of my postgraduate law school. Through one miracle after another, through hard work, I got to where God wanted me to be. You see, when God's got a plan for your life, circumstances and storms will come, but that plan's ordained on your life. And, and we shouldn't give up. Don't give up. At 29 years old, uh, Karen and I, we started our own law firm, and it took off. It absolutely went amazing. Uh, but unfortunately, we started to make a few mistakes as we went along. We started to live a bit large. Um, we started to live beyond our, our means. Consumerism took hold of us when a little bit of success started to come. And uh, very soon after we'd started the business, the GFC hit, the global financial crisis, and we were very much a property law-based firm. And, and things started to get a bit wobbly for us. Business started to slow. Some of our clients we had were going bust, and, and our business was looking precariously uh, uh, in terms of survival. And not only that, is Karen and I had invested our own personal finances a lot into a building company and into a development company, and they all went down and went bust. And so it was an absolute storm in our finances. And we'd borrowed so heavily to get into these different investments that we found ourselves underwater with loads of debt. And at 34, we found ourselves pretty much broke, this incredible turn, downturn, and we're living in a lovely waterfront home at, uh, on the Sunshine Coast, and uh, again, living beyond our means, we, we probably never should have moved there, we couldn't afford it, and we had to move out of there, we pretty much had to sell all that we could, and we found ourselves, at 34 years old, living at home with my parents, and it's a humbling thing, you know, when people look at you, you're the owner of a law firm, and, and materially, it looked like we're doing amazing, and then you move home with your folks, it, it's a humbling moment. Um, I joke a little bit that, uh, you know, moving in, living with your mum and your wife as an Italian boy, it ain't such a bad thing. Uh, wasn't so good for my wife, though. But, but although we were in that desperate, difficult situation at 34 years old, um, like I did when I was 17, we began to control some things. We began to look at what we control. We took control of our spending. We created a money plan, and those who would have done the Lifetime Wealth course with us before, you'd realize we go through our journey and the steps that we brought in place to see a radical turnaround in our finances to where we are today. But the first thing we did was put a money plan in place, which told every dollar that we earned where to go. We would not spend a cent more than, what, than we earned. We started living within our means, and this was going to be our roadmap out of financial disaster. We had more money than month, sorry, more month than money, so I took a second job. Our expenses were higher than, uh, than what our income was, so we needed to change that. So I'd work hard all day at the law firm, and then I'd come home, play with my little boy, kiss my wife goodnight, and then I'd go out and do a second job. It wasn't easy. It was humbling. But we were going to do what it took to get control of our situation and turn it around. We had to make ends meet to make sure that our income exceeded our expenses. It wasn't easy, but we are going to stick to our plan and control what we could because it was within our power to control our spending and how hard we worked, like that scripture said. We sold anything that we could, that we had debt over, and anything we didn't really need. And we got our thinking on money straight. We didn't care what other people thought about us moving home or selling everything. Uh, I, I realized that image is the enemy of wealth. We can't care about what other people think. It's my race, it's your race. Forget what others think. We live in this insta-perfect world where there's this constant pressure on us to look and act and be a certain way. Forget that. It, it, it's, it's not real life. Trying to look good and live beyond our means is what got us into this mess. And we set our hearts on getting out as quickly as we could. Dave Ramsey, the financial commentator for America, says, live like no one else, so later you can live like no one else. There's terrific wisdom in that. He understood that do the hard things now, put the great things in place now, so later on you can enjoy the benefits. My dad used to say, Ash, you'll pay now and play later. Or you play now, but you're going to have to pay later. Craig Rochelle puts it this way. He says, if you want what normal people have... Do what normal people do. If you want what few people have, do what few people do. And that's being disciplined with our, with our money. You know, we stuck to our money plan like glue when we were trying to get out of it. I remember we, uh, in, in a month we'd have like $15 uh, left over to be able to spend on entertainment. You know, one of us could go and get a coffee. Uh, it, it was pretty tough going. I remember being in Woolworths, having a set amount for, for groceries. And, and as the cashier was checking things through, having to tell them to stop because I didn't have enough money to buy any more, and can you please refund that last item? That's pretty humbling. It's a tough, and I know many of you might have been in that place. It's not a nice place to be. And I long remember that feeling because I never, ever wanted to go back there. You know, my staff would ask me, why are you living so strictly like this? And now they say, gee, you guys are so lucky. It's amazing how things can turn around. You see, we started to save, to rebuild. Friends, savings are the cornerstone of, of wealth. Savings are the foundation upon 
which your financial turnaround and success will be built. We worked hard and we stuck to our money plan. Look, it wasn't easy, but Karen and I hustled. We toughed it out to correct our mistakes and in five years, our situation had turned around and now we're at a place where we're financially free. Guys, if you're young here, if you're in your 20s, forget about image. Try and work hard. Spend less than you earn. Don't worry about image. Guard against greed. It was consumerism in our lives so easily creeps in in this insta-perfect world. It, it'll cause you to spend money you don't have to, uh, on things you don't need to impress people you don't even like. And we can't get caught up into that trap. For us, consumerism did play a part in our financial failure. And you know, living in the, in the property we couldn't afford, encumbered with debt, driving two cars fully, uh, new cars that we had payments on and didn't own. We were underwater in debt. So we set about paying our debt down as quickly as we could. We committed to start acting our wage, my wife would say. Uh, only buying things that we'd saved up for within our money plan. No zip pay, no after pay. We did something called super, save up and buy after. It's good old fashioned saving to get out or to buy what you need. We started to run our own race and not the race set by those perfect looking lives around us. We stopped spending on image and instead started saving for reserves. The Bible holds so many examples about the importance of reserves in life. It commends us to take the example from the ant, you know, which stores up in the good times because it knows winter's going to come. Every year, winter comes for that ant and it knows tough times will come. In our life, we know tough times are going to come. That's why we should start building some reserves into our finance and you'll feel an incredible peace when you hold reserves. We put these smart money principles that the Bible teaches in place and began to control our money rather than it controlling us and we began to prosper. Guys, if you're struggling here, there is hope. At our Lifetime Wealth course, uh, we give you the tools that you need to get your finances in order and to set yourself up to master money instead of being its servant. You know, the younger you are, the more important it is that you follow these principles and you avoid some of the big mistakes that uh, can so easily be made and hold you back in your finances. If you haven't done our money course, I encourage you, look out for it. Uh, we often come here yearly. We'd love to do it. Email us, get in touch with us because we care about people doing well with, with money. You're not alone in this. Prospering financially, guys, seldom happens. You need to put actions in place to bring it about. And that brings me to my third point. There is nothing wrong with prospering. I love how it's expansion month. You know, uh, prospering here is just like, uh, well, God, God wants to see you prosper in our life. It says in 3 John 2, says, I pray that you might prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Guys, I encourage you to reject any idea that it's more holy to be poor or somehow uh, less or evil to be rich. This is a lie that the enemy has tried to sell the church and devour to keep us ineffective, to keep the church poor from expanding. Imagine the good the church could do if it had twice as much as what it does already. Wouldn't that be phenomenal? You know, Jesus had money, many wealthy people around him that supported his ministry. He didn't shun them or reject them. He blessed them. He spent time with them. I love the story about Zacchaeus where the Bible says that uh, he was a greedy man and the, and the institution mocked Jesus for spending time with him. But what happened to Zacchaeus when Jesus got in his life? Generosity erupted. You see, uh, Zacchaeus became an incredible blessing to the body of Christ. I've realized that the more resources that I have, the greater blessing I can be. And I believe the more God prospers you in your life, the greater blessing you can be. You know, if we need rescuing ourselves, it's very, very hard for us to rescue others. And so we want to be in a position where we can rescue, Christian or not, here today. I've learned that the more I have, the more I can do, and the more I can influence for good. You know, we've got poor in our city. We've got destitute in our city. And if we're in a position to be able to assist them, we can bring that blessing and bring the good news. Why don't I do more good than I already do? It's because my resources are limited. So I pray, I rejoice when more comes our way because it's, we can then do more. Money has an important role in building the church and blessing our community. Now, let me be clear. Having money or no money has nothing to do with holiness or the hand of God on your life. Money is a form of exchange. It's a tool to be used and nothing more. And also give you a caution. In Luke, it talks about who much is given, much is required. We need to give account of the resources that God has brought our way. And you know, despite Karen and, the, uh, and my hardships that we went through, we always made giving and generosity a priority. Even if it was only a few dollars each week, we wanted to sow for two reasons. Firstly, when I gave, it made me feel like I had more than enough because out of my money plan, uh, I was able to do something for someone else. It took our, our eyes off our own need. It took our eyes off, uh, off ourselves and put it on others and put it onto God as our provider. And the second thing, I realized that when you sow something, it opens the door to increase. If I have seed, when I release it, then I've got an opportunity to see a return. It's a natural law and it's a spiritual law and it works for everybody. 
you know, uh, giving, uh, when we give, it takes from the present, from our present, and it creates our future. It's an amazing thing. You're setting up your future. You know, Luke 6.38 says, give and you'll receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together, to make room for more running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. The fourth and final thing I wanted to share with you today is that Jesus made it clear that giving is for everyone. It has nothing to do with the amount, rather it has to do with the heart. You know, there's a story in Luke 21 about the widow who gave just a small amount. And Jesus commended that. He goes, guys, you need to look what this lady's doing. She wanted to just be involved in something. It didn't matter how much she gave. Jesus didn't care about that. He cares about a heart attitude. Friends, you and I can be generous now. Don't wait to have more before you, you, you give. Build those habits in your life today. Plan for it. Otherwise, when more comes... You're not going to have those habits to give. Don't think, what difference can I make? You don't need to be the answer to every situation. Just be part of the solution. You know, there's the, um, there's the story of when Jesus was down by the lakeside feeding, uh, well, there were five or 10,000 people with him. And Jesus said to his disciples, we need to feed these people. And the disciples said, how on earth are we going to do that? And Jesus said, we'll go out and find a solution. And they came back with one little boy, one boy with a few loaves and a couple of fish. And I can't believe that he was the only person there with food. What, there would have been plenty of people there with a little bit of food. But you, why was he the one that came back? Well, I believe that he was the one that was happy to be part of the solution. The other people thought, I've got too little. What difference can I do? What, 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 I can't, I've, I'm of no effect. That little boy didn't have that attitude. He goes, I'm going to be part of the solution. Friends, you don't need to be the answer. I don't need to be the answer. We just need to be part of the solution. We have no idea what our small gift can multiply into. Yes, it takes a step of faith to be generous, especially when things are tight, just like that widow. But it's in those moments that giving habits are formed and you, provide, and you prove to yourself who you rely on as your provider. And finally, where do we give? Well, firstly, the Bible commends us to give to our church, where you're covered and fed spiritually for the good work that the church does. It encourages us to do that. It encourages us to give a tithe of what we earn. It's no longer law, but many of the Bible heroes did it before the law. They did it during the law and they've done it after the law. Karen and I have made it our practice all our life and I know many here do that as well. This church believes it and it's part of our worship and acknowledgement that he's our provider. The second area we give is to the disadvantaged, to poor, to widows, to the orphans. Proverbs 19, 17 says, whoever uh, is generous to the poor lends to the Lord and he'll repay him for his deed. We must consider the poor. And the third place that we can give is wherever God leads you terms of your offerings but whenever you give make sure it's planned and budgeted without compulsion guys i know what it's like to struggle to make ends meet and also what it's like to have more than enough wherever you are on your faith and your finance journey begin to put these principles in place today to handle money start today start small and see what god can do through you in your family and community just like that little boy did with the loaves and fishes be part of the solution Jensen Franklin says the big things in life normally happen to those who are faithfully doing the little things. Let me pray for you today. Father, I thank you for this incredible community of Highlands Church. Lord, I just pray for each family represented here today. Lord, while they're on their faith and their finance journey, that you'd be with them, that you would give them guidance in knowing what they can control. Understanding that despite a storm being present, you're in the midst of it and you're there to help and you care about their prospering. Lord, I just command a blessing upon every family here today, their finances, their marriages, their kids, their health, their workplaces, their businesses. Lord, I just declare increase over them, particularly as they're coming into this season of giving. Lord God, that you would guide them about what part they can play in this, that they don't need to be the solution, but they can just be part of the solution. And I pray, pray whatever they do, you multiply their gift and their effectiveness. Let them be blessed today. And while everyone's got their eyes uh, closed and their heads bowed, I'd just like to stand, extend an invitation. I never want to miss an opportunity just to see if you're here today and you've never started your journey walking with, with God. You've never asked God to be part of your life. Maybe just exploring this religion thing. And you'd like to say, you know what? I need help. I need something bigger than me in my world. I want the creator of the universe to be on my side, looking after me and my family. I want him with me in this life. And you know what? I want assurance that one day when I leave this planet, I'm going to have eternity with him in heaven. If you've ever asked him to become part of your life, just give me a quick wave today because I'd love to pray with you. A simple prayer, just inviting him to be part of your life. It's that simple. Is there anyone here today? Ask him for the last time. Give me a quick wave. Amen.